the interacting with reality's operations is what time and nature provides. It's the structure. And then the payoff is this lightness and energetic renewal that helps you answer the question of who am I and what am I here to do? And the more that we can get ourselves and the people that we love into that type of situation and those and helping to discover the answers to those questions, the better off we're going to be and the world will be. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Blizzy. Today, we have a real treat as we get to explore nature with a friend of the show, Emmanuel Rose. Now, he's a special individual. He's actually spent a lifetime in the world of marketing, but he's pivoted a lot of that work into the world of exploration of nature and in particular storytelling to engage our kids and bring them into the wilds of nature. He has a series about Wanaha Henry, which he has just really begun. And here we see a coloring book. There's a children's story along with a Doug fir set of trees to plant, as well as a guide to get you into the wilderness with the next generation called Nature Bound with Wanaha Henry. So these books are a real treat. My kids have already been exploring their pages with me, wanting to take part in the activities and really learn more. Let me tell you for a moment, about Emmanuel Rose. He's an author, he's an outdoorsman and marketing expert. He merges this love of nature with a thriving career in marketing. And really nature's influence shines in his children's series, Winaha Henry. It imparts lessons of compassion, ecosystems, family, and storytelling. Emmanuel Rose, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Karina. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, take two of our conversation, huh? For those that are <laughs> watching and listening, we got pretty far into a conversation that I only happened to record the audio of as backup. So now you get to see this live and in person. But um, I wanted to show you guys all on YouTube, if you happen to be watching there, just the cover of these books, beautifully illustrated, Red Tail Hawk, Wanaha Henry. Um, there's a coloring book for kids. And as soon as this arrived, my older son, who's eight now, just couldn't resist himself and already started coloring its pages. Um, and then you have this children's book, Wanaha Henry, Seeds to a Tree. And it even includes those Douglas fir seeds and instructions on how to plant them. So I'm looking forward to finding the spot either on my property or in the open space preserved behind my house to plant this beautiful tree, given enough water to get it start. I just wanted to start really by having you share your story, what inspired you as this marketer to pivot so much of your time, energy, and effort into creating this children's book and series. Well, with the grandkids in our lives, uh, they're, they're remote from us. And, and so um, I wanted to have a way to uh, inspire and trigger and share the ethics that I've learned um, in my lifetime in a in a fun and um, and deep way, both for them and for their parents, and it really was a very organic process of um, having had the thought about it and not really put any action to it. One day, I was sitting next to the Wanaha River after a long fruitless turkey hunt, and mm -hmm. uh, and I was staring across the Wanaha River at a, a a, a large wall that was a mosaic, kind of like Klimt's The Kiss. And there was a red-tailed hawk circling um, above that. And um, in that, in that kind of magical mis uh, mixture of, of sound and visuals, it just came to me that uh, went, oh, Henry, the red-tailed hawk. And, um, and that's where I, I created, I created the character. I was inspired to create the character. And uh, from there, I, I spent uh, spent the next few months writing writing the stories, and um, as a way to as a gift to uh, to Henry and to other kids who may may uh, be triggered into action by 
uh, by these stories. Yeah. Well, one of the themes that you talk about um, as you're kind of reading through some of the opening pages and Nature Bound with Manaha Henry is this need to really engage kids with the outdoors. And there's so many reasons for that, right? Like we want to get them off of screen time. We want them to understand nature and the complexity of our ecosystems to be advocates for our climate and for all of Earth's inhabitants and and to ultimately have a more well-rounded education about just what it is to be a living being. But you also put into this book, you know, gosh, so many different family activities that could really inspire you to get into the wilderness in a way that is exploratory and that opens your mind the way you might be as a six-year-old who's encountering some of this wonder for the first time. So if there's a favorite activity in the book, um, the, specifically I'm speaking to Nature Bound with Manaha Henry right now, yeah. what what is it? What's your favorite activity? Uh, easily above everything else is the lone sit, is to creating uh, a, a, a space for for your child or for you to spend a defined amount of time uh, by yourself, just observing what's going on, preferably near moving water. And we know this from Aboriginal cultures that uh, these these times alone, um, for a predetermined amount of time, sometimes as long as four days, um, which I have done and have gotten great value from myself. And it's something that's missing from the busy schedule of parents and kids that um, when every minute is uh, a flute lesson and a soccer class and, uh, you know, French class and going to school and, you know, on and on and on that um, there's not a lot of time of just of sit and reflection. And the more that we can do that as the mentor um, and then share that in a constructive and safe way with the kids, then the more um, access they're going to have to their own humanity. So Anne-Therese Gennari, she mentions this whole um, concept of feeling like when she's alone in nature and she sits there in the woods or in a glade or just in the middle of that quiet open space, that she feels like that's when she gets messages from, I don't know what you call it, but she says it feels like it comes from somewhere external. Right. And that's yeah. where her big ideas are generated and things like that. That's yeah. where she's able to kind of connect with that inner or outer voice that feels like it speaks to her and really get clear with what her power and intention should be in this next stage or when she's asking the big questions. And I find a lot of the same where when I am out in nature and spending time amongst, amongst the redwoods or out by the ocean, that that is when I find that. I just get that kind of clarity that I think we so often seek, but can't find in the cement jungles of our lives. So I really do appreciate that. Um, you know, there's also this whole concept that when we are in na natural spaces, when we are able to take our shoes off and spend time with our feet firmly on the ground, that we're able to connect with the water that's in the environment and, and actually rebalance ourselves and become more alkaline if we're running over acidic. Like there's all this science behind what this nature bathing can actually do for our health, <laughs> both from that mental health perspective and the physical health perspective, like the two are connected. Um, what has your experience been in this arena? Do you have examples that you like to share? Well, I studied with a man named Tom Brown, who is... Um they call him the tracker and he was uh, trained in the lip and apache um uh tradition and so yeah the, there's a it's all nature bathing we would uh do a would do an exercise where actually dig a dig a, a hole in the ground a coffin sized hole and you bury yourself in dirt and mm -hmm. uh, um so you are just laying in there and you feel a different heartbeat of nature buried in the dirt than you do sitting on the rock next to it. Um, so yeah, my commitment to myself is one, one week a month, I'm, I'm, um, screen free. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's true. I, I'm similar to the woman you were describing where the, the big inspiration and the, uh, the be the re-energization that I get is, um, is critical enough that I, I commit that much time every month. 
Well, a week, a month is generous. I can't imagine that as a parent of a five and an eight year old, I'd be able to accomplish that without taking them with me. And then, you know, for sure, not, it's not happening as a solo enterprise, that's for certain. Um, but we do try to get out there and go hiking and also just take the time to, to go camping on a routine basis. But even in today's world, it's like, okay, you bring the tablet with you and the backup battery and hmm, your phones are for taking film and pictures and things like that too. So um, it, it makes me miss sometimes that analog lifestyle of the past. Um, just even thinking about something like, well, you know, real camera with film as opposed to <laughs> your phone to take all these pictures. Um, and I think that there's this perception that if you somehow didn't document it, it didn't happen. Now there's a movement in a younger generation of people that you know, some are just saying, I'm choosing not to have social media. I'm choosing not even to carry with me a phone. I've actually met a young uh, Gen, Gen Z person who's just chosen to say goodbye to you know, a cell phone, doesn't have one. He has a tablet and he can use apps on it when he needs to, but has chosen not to have a cell phone. And I'm like, wow. How can you even do that today? It, it gives me something to, to move towards, I think. So um, I think your aspirations for this book, is, as you've at least described them to me in both this prior little sejour of 17 minutes that we had that was not available for video, <laughs> that um, a lot of your inspiration was around getting people to commune with nature, especially in a time where our natural world is, is changing and in some cases is, is suffering from too much water or too little fires and floods. So what do you see out there in the Pacific Northwest and, and what good signs do you possibly see for the health of our forests? Well, uh, the, the forests are, are, are being forests. That's the good news. Uh, so I was recently on the, on the, the coastal section of the Rogue River and uh, saw a burn that had happened two or three years ago and the understory had gotten cleared out and the, the big trees were, were healthy still. Um, and so it's just starting to come back um, on, you know, the, the, the bushes and, and flowers. So that, that was encouraging. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's tough. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of encroachment um, from humans. And so that, that changes the way that the forests behave. Um, and, uh, but in general, I think there's a, a good awareness. I think what my hope and dream would be for, for those of us who care and love about the forests and animals is that we would go and, and spend more time as a group, um, outside off the trail, um, really with the, the, the feet in the dirt, like you're talking about, um, out of the out of the five hundred dollar hiking boots, away from the the thousand dollar North Face tent, and spend a night outside in a debris hut, or spend a night outside with a wool blanket next to a river, and and really feel the vibration that is happening, and not not just the intellectual exercise. Well, so you're saying say goodbye to our Patagonia fleece and our... <laughs> not goodbye, but just just uh, put it away for a, a day or two, right? Like really experience it, not just intellectually. Yeah. Well, my younger son, I should say my older son, he's eight now, right? He keeps asking me, he says, mom, I want to camp outside, but without a tent. And I'm just terrified that he's going to end up covered in bed bug bites or not bed bugs, but you know, mosquitoes or whatever else, especially if you're near a body of water. Right. And so, yeah. um, I've hesitated to say yes to that, but we often do backyard camping on our own property. And I think if I was going to give it a try, I'd say, okay, you can take your sleeping bag and sleep on the hammock we have in the yard or something like that and <laughs> see how he does. But um, as a family, that perhaps sounds a little bit more extreme than I'm ready for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got their, everybody's got what they're able to do, their limits, right? Yeah. Well, I have girlfriends who do a lot of backpacking and, you know, they go off for multiple days into the mountains of, um, you know, around Tahoe and things like that. Yeah. And will you know, just go with what they have on their back. So I know they're sleeping without a tent and I have yet to join them. So perhaps that's my <laughs> next adventure. So tell me, tell our audience a little bit about Winaha Henry in particular and what makes this character so, I think, appealing to young kids. Well, he's the hero and he is um, 
entering situations um, as a as a beginner it, with beginner's mind and asking the questions and and looking for uh, the wisdom from um, not just his elders or or the subject matter experts that he meets, but also uh, from the from the vibration in the in the um, pulse of, of the forest and making sense of um, how to participate in a way that is of uh, value to himself and his family and his community and uh, and the forest in, in the bigger picture. You know, you mentioned vibrations a couple of times thus far. And a few years ago, we might have seen this as more woo-woo than we might presently. Um, there's science that shows people are generally of clearer mind and also better health when they spend more time in nature. And so, you know, what would you say to somebody who might be a little skeptical, who might say still that they have a hard time thinking about the vibrations of spending time in the great outdoors? I think I would say test it. That's fine. We'll turn your phone off, leave it in the car, go for a walk next to a creek and sit on a rock and and sit there as long as you can stand it, right? And uh, um, participate in, in some way, um, knowing that this this um, adventure that we've created with technology, this uh, this addiction with technology is a is a new thing, and it's not making us more human. And mm-hmm. uh, and, and most people are not happier because they're using all this technology. Um, I was listening to your happiness expert blog or podcast early, and I was like, "Yeah, go!" The, all these <laughs> things are not making us happy. And you can research it. You can research, uh, you know, Joe Dispenza and these guys who are are, are uh, talking about spiritual things in in uh, Western uh, medicine um, terminology and understand it from the rational side of the brain. Or you can um, go and take, you know, schedule four hours and go for a walk uh, next to a creek and experience it. Well, what do they say too? It's um, you know, time with family and friends. In the great outdoors is one of the best uses of time that you can have on this planet. Um, you know, sharing a meal with people, breaking bread. Um, I once got to tell tell the story of the medicine hunter Chris Killam on this podcast, where he described what to me sounded like pure heaven. Where he and some um, I'm, I'm forgetting what culture these people were from, but they essentially hiked off into the woods, mostly just like barefoot, essentially found this river mouth, harvested some um, wild river shrimp from the river mouth, um, played in the waterfall, got some tubers from underground and like made a fire and cooked all the food they harvested from that spot right then and there. And then eventually we're just like looking at one another and just broke out in delirious laughter because it was just obviously such a perfect moment. And you know, you mentioned that you're off in the woods turkey hunting. I mean, granted, that was not the the day that you wanted because you didn't get to bring home a bird, but um, it was the day you needed because you got inspired by this Winaha Henry. So there is something, I think, to that. Um, when I invited Stephen Hawley on this podcast, too, he wrote um, the book Cracked, which is out by Patagonia Press and which really talks about the crumbling infrastructure of our dams in the Pacific Northwest and how they've damaged our river ecosystems. And while they might have supplied green energy, they supply a surplus and more than we need now. Um, And at the same time, they're expensive to maintain and they have really killed the um, spawning grounds for the salmon. And so salmon aren't coming as far into the forests and because salmon aren't coming as far into the forest, they're not leaving the nutrients behind that they captured in the oceans. You have a decline in the salmon species so that then the orca aren't able to flourish as much because they rely on the salmon to for their diet. And the forests, it's documented, trees grow 50% taller in grounds where there's salmon spawning as opposed to, or as 50% taller, 50% faster than areas where they don't. So um, I'm curious if you have thoughts about the elimination of dams in the Pacific Northwest and what what you might say about that, that whole concept. 
Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of positives for it. Um, obviously, it's going to open up a ton of spawning grounds. And like you're talking about, all all these things are connected. And the uh, the protein that those anadromous fish provide, salmon and steelhead, um, are, are um, pulled all the way through the forest, um, sometimes as much as 50 square miles from the, uh, from the, the river. So you don't think about that, but it's because the birds, the birds that prey on them also bring them to their nests, which can be far off. And so it's just, it's amazing how, how intertwined these ecosystems really are. It's true. I think the one, the one challenge, because uh, down on the Klamath River, they're pulling those three dams out. Uh, what we are going to see is a different kind of flooding um, and uh, in high water events. And we have encroached on the river because of how what the size that it's been so there is going to be some collateral damage that um will will be impact the humans for sure um but overall it is uh it will open up a lot more spawning and and, and change it um as long as we haven't completely lost the genetic stocks uh, of those fish so um the we do know also the rivers clear very quickly the sediment that's upstream uh on the, both on the elwa and the sandy river um, Washington and Oregon, uh, those cleared in one, one season. So if there's a, a good, uh, water event, uh, the sediment gets pushed out in the ocean and then, uh, it's a free flowing river again. So, um, especially if there's, you know, if it's not an electricity need, um, it's a, it's a very positive thing. Well, there are other methods to get, you know, green energy solar geothermal among a couple harnessing the power of waves wind you know there's other technologies we can use that aren't as damaging to the ecosystems that don't kill our rivers you know stephen hawley also suggested that you know if you were a skeptic or even if you weren't and just to to spend more time by the rivers and appreciation because it really is the life force you know we evolved near water for a reason the rivers enabled us to go further inland and into the mountains because we'd have a fresh water source. They they clean the environment at the same time. And you know, if you even just wade into a super cold river from ocean from the um, ice and snow melt, um, I mean, I do that here. Even just in the San Lorenzo, which you know isn't the most pristine, but it's all you know melt water essentially from the Sierras. Right, right. water can be very cold. And there is also science behind the health of allowing your body to get to this low temp for right. a little bit. And then, you know, you emerge from that. And it's kind of this hot, cold therapy that you can um, actually help to relieve inflammatory issues and things like that in your body just by, you know, going into the river's waters for a little bit. So I wanted to ask you a question about the Doug fir tree because you chose Doug firs, I'm sure, for a reason. Um, so... Why did you choose to to provide seeds of Douglas firs, knowing that um, it's also a tree that needs a lot of space? And how does one best ensure that these seeds would come to fruition and create a, a fifty to eighty foot tall tree? Well, the the Doug fir is uh, is pretty widespread on the West Coast, of the United States, and. And so I knew that it would be one that would adapt well to a lot of places. And um, there's a, a great company in Arcata, California called the Johnstein Company. And, and they're the source of the seeds. And they do uh, seed packs of all different kinds of trees. Um, they sell in the national parks and things like that. Um, and um, the follow the directions and call Johnstein to best get those things to sprout if you're having issues um they're the tree experts i'm i'm the storyteller <laughs> i'll stay in my lane on that one <laughs> that's good no that's perfect no i um I, you've provided there's like a puck in here to to offer saturation of moisture which i think expands um and in my experience you know i've, I've got two doug firs on my property they haven't sent up any young ones um i think because there may just not be enough space for them but we did have a couple of saplings when we moved in that we realized we'd just create too much underbrush because they take a while to establish. They ended up being our self-harvested Charlie Brown Christmas trees one year and then the next. Um, but, you know, again, we didn't have really enough space for them. 
and you have to worry about fire ladders and things like that here uh, in California. So um, I'm thinking about where we could possibly plant a couple in the open space preserve, but understanding how much water trees take to get started. My plan was to start these out in like a container, get them to the point where they're just a little tree, right? And then go plant them with like a water bag that I go fill every once in a while so that they have time to establish and actually become healthy. Um, I think I can get permission to do that. So I'm actually going to see if I need to go a specific route that way, <laughs> given that it's an op the land trust of Santa Cruz manages the, the property. All right. All right. So, um, you know, just as we think about this kind of last stage of the interview, I like to ask my guests to, to really think about the, the message that they would want to leave our audience with. And if there is a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had, you could ask and answer it. This, this could lead to another 10 or 15 minute discussion. For me, the, um, the joy and freedom and lessons that I've learned outside is is what um, is the inspiration for me in that um, being in situations where I have to use my brain in order to get out safely um, that can only happen out in nature, you know, where you get get pounded by a rainstorm that, that you didn't know about or that it's uh, one one day it's sunny and 70 degrees and the next day it's freezing and the trees that had burned the season before are falling down and you've got to get out safely. That um, the interacting with reality's operations is what, what time in nature uh, provides. It's the structure. And then the, the payoff is this um, lightness and energetic renewal that helps you answer the question of who am I and what am I here to do? And the more that we can, get ourselves and the people that we love into that type of situation and those and, and helping to discover the answers to those questions, then the the better off we're going to be and the world will be. What do you take from this exploration of wilderness that you know you apply in your day to day as a marketer and professional in the world of business? The biggest thing is patience and never allowing myself to think that I'm smarter than the marketplace, right? I'm not smarter mm. than nature. I'm not smarter than the marketplace. I have to, I have to observe and then I have to act from those observations and then I have to retool based on the results that happen. And it's, it's, those are identical in both situations. I love that. I think it's so, it so clearly applies. And as somebody who spends time also in developing brands and helping people market, it's it's just so critical that we learn from what we innately know from nature. There's there's so much to gain there. I agree. Well, I just want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. There's a couple of closing thoughts that I have that I thought I would just share with our audience and then offer you the opportunity to comment on as well. Um, you know, We've, we've heard a lot over the course of this podcast about the need for change, the need for more activism, the, lead, the need for more climate activists out there banging the drum. And I feel like this call to nature, um, communing with nature, nature bathing, it's not only imperative for our mental health and our emotional health, it's also imperative to inspire us to defend our most precious natural resources in every way possible. Um, I've had guests on who have said, we're going to need a billion activists and we're not going to get them. I've had other guests like Paul Hawkins say we're absolutely going to get them. And over the course of the last week, we've seen floods that are unprecedented in spaces over Europe. And now there's been, uh, as of September 12th, a huge flood that had two dams bust in Libya, and at least 10,000 people have lost their lives. I think that these are indications that we are going to get the billion activists that we need and that Paul Hawken is right. But we also need to understand that there's this thing called climate lag. And that means that as much as we 
bring of ourselves into this present moment, as much as we are able to reduce our emissions and start to repair our environments and protect and preserve this natural world, we're still likely to see these problems continue for the next 30 years after the point at which we stop the carbon emissions from accumulating. So it will be easy to get discouraged. I uh, think it's important that we, we keep in our mind and in our hearts this deep understanding that ecosystems can recover and remarkably quickly if we let them. I had this thought during COVID, and I don't know if you experienced it as well, but there was a good six-month period where we were pretty much on lockdown here in the central coast of California. Our schools were closed, daycares closed, because I was in graduate school and also going um, <laughs> through full-time work, I had to move a friend in to help take care of my kids. Now, in that period, we saw coyotes start to go into the main streets, cougars starting to, to you know, perch on branches above walkways in downtown Santa Cruz. I saw a sky that was bluer than I remembered ever seeing it. Noise pollution was way down because there were near, not nearly as many cars on the road. There weren't nearly as many as airplanes in the sky. And I personally saw more wildlife every time I went out for hike. If we give nature the time to recover, it can and it will. And most certainly from what I've seen and from what science shows, you know, it will recover with or without us. So it's absolutely in our interest to be part of the solutions right now. So with that, I want to step off of my soapbox <laughs> and see, Emmanuel, if you have closing thoughts that you want to share before we part ways today. For me, I want to continue to encourage people to um, mentor the, the kids in their lives to be outside and to explore who they are and what they're here to do. And um, take them outside and let them sit by themselves. A dear friend of mine said, the greatest gift that you can get to your, give to your kids is to let them be bored. <laughs> yeah. And this is something that I believe too, because it's through boredom that you start to see their creativity just come alive. And if you give them the outdoors and you give them that boredom, suddenly they're creating whole universes in their minds as they initiate play with the wild world. And I, I just couldn't echo that enough. I completely agree. Thank you, Emmanuel. To learn more about Emmanuel Rose and the adventures of Wanaha Henry, you can visit my website, caremorebebetter.com. There I will have links to buy the book, complete transcripts from our conversation today, additional resources, and perhaps even outtakes from that 17 minutes that I just didn't get to share with you all in video form. You can sign up for our newsletter to receive a five-step guide that will help you organize your efforts, become a better activist, or even just manage a project that's in front of you. It includes sustainability notes that, and resources where you can educate yourself a bit more too about the sorts of things that you can do to make a difference. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe wherever you're listening to this show. I read every single review that I receive. And so if you want to go ahead and leave me a comment or write a review, I greatly appreciate that too. So for this one last effort, I want to again, hold up these amazing books for those of you that are on YouTube. You have the Wanaha Henry, and this is specifically the nature bound guide to help get you into the wilderness with great activities to inspire you. You have the children's book, which includes the Doug First Seeds and also the coloring book. Now, I think they make a great gift. And this episode is coming out just in time for holiday shopping. So if you're already doing that, consider picking them up as well. You can also go to winahahenry.com if you wanted to go ahead and explore them directly. But as always, I will provide those links with our show notes and on our website. Thank you, listeners and watchers now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even share the natural beauty of our world with our children. We can protect and preserve its beauty for generations to come together. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts and share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.